economic thinkers who really begin the profession, the people just before them, Adam Smith and David Ricardo. You remember I mentioned them to you. They are considered to be the fathers of modern economics. Um, Adam Smith wrote about the time of the American Revolution, 1776, and about 25, 30 years later, David Ricardo wrote. So they each wrote basic founding books, and Marx was terribly excited by their explanation for why prices were what they were. Because Adam Smith and David Ricardo both agreed, and I know for some of you this will be a shock, but I hope it will be one of many as we go along. What did Adam Smith and David Ricardo say was the explanation for the prices of goods in markets? The answer was both of them developed a labor theory of value. Some of you, I know, have taken some courses and read some books and are under the impression that this is Marx's invention. I wish, but it isn't so. Adam Smith, often considered the great champion of modern capitalism, and for good reason, and David Ricardo, who certainly was a champion of they thought that labor explains the value of things. So the, the labor theory of value, a theory that says values are what they are because of labor. Marx was excited because you can see why. Here he had a bridge to take us from a discussion of commodities and values, which everybody wants to talk about, to what he wants to talk about, which is how you organize the labor. He was given an enormous assist by Smith and Ricardo because they, before he was born, had formulated the idea, if you want to know why something costs this amount of money versus that amount, the answer is, here we go, I'm not going to quote Adam Smith. The values of goods and services depend, quote, on the amount of toil and trouble needed to produce them. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, what an idea. The values of goods in markets are determined by the amount of labor needed to produce. So you want to know why a shirt costs $10 and a uh, sneaker costs $40 and uh, that rug costs $200? The answer is the amount of labor needed to produce it. Adam Smith and David Ricardo, that was their idea. Marx loved this. He was accepted. It was extraordinary. It was um, Marx loved this idea, and Marx took it from them, giving them ample credit. And Marx said, yes, yes, he said, that's right. I think they have a very good point, that the value of commodities is linked to the labor needed to produce them. So strictly speaking, labor theory of value says the value of a commodity is determined by the amount of labor needed to produce it. But at that level, Marx is in agreement with Smith and Ricardo. Nothing new yet. Let's see what this means. It means that, for example, if it takes me two hours, on the average, to make a shirt, and it takes me two hours, on the average, to produce a bushel of potatoes. Then in the market, in the market, that's what the theory says, a bushel of potatoes will equal, what did I say, a shirt? A shirt. Why will one shirt equal a bushel of potatoes? Because they each, each of those two things requires the same amount of labor. The same amount of labor is in a bushel of potatoes as in one shirt. And the idea here is really simple. I am a worker. I could either, either make shirts or I could grow potatoes. If the amount of time it takes me to grow potatoes, I can exchange those potatoes for a shirt, and that will get me a shirt which I could have made myself in the same amount of time, so I'm happy to grow either potatoes or make shirts. If, however, anything were to happen, you can do this little exercise at home if you want, to make the relationship between potatoes and shirts 
other than the amount of labor in them. Let's say a bushel of potatoes got you two shirts. Just let's imagine. Then nobody in their right mind would spend, say, an hour, or whatever I say, an hour, to produce a shirt, because in an hour you'd have one shirt. You'd better use your hour to make a, a bushel of potatoes, and then in the market you're exchanging get two shirts. So your one hour via the potatoes gets you two shirts in the market. So guess what would happen? Right? Nobody would produce shirts, because it's irrational. Everybody would produce potatoes. But of course, if everybody produces potatoes, the supply of potatoes will go up. Meanwhile, the supply of shirts will go down because no one's making them. And that'll change the price back to the point where one hour worth of potatoes in the market exchanges for one hour worth of shirts. This was a simple logical argument that Smith, Ricardo, and everybody else at that time in England and in Western Europe took as obvious, to be all with me, the labor theory of value was the dominant, obvious, logical explanation. Okay? Yes? Did the theory take into account the fact that, let's say, people might prefer doing one thing rather than the other? So that if everybody liked growing potatoes rather than making shirts, they might prefer working two hours of growing potatoes than an hour and a half. Mostly not. In those days, it was thought that labor being what it is, if you could spend less time doing labor and get the same bundle of goods, you were probably better off that way. So, but there may have been, I don't want to claim to know the whole literature, there may have been some people who worried about that, who might have taken this idea and said, you know, it doesn't always work because there could be certain kinds of preferences for this kind of good or this kind of labor that would get you something. But it was still the framework within which these questions were asked. Would that be a problem for the labor theory of Sure. Sure it could. Sure it could. For Smith and Ricardo, it actually did create such problems. Because they wanted it to be meant literally. They really wanted it to be meant literally. That you get as many, the, potato, the ratio of the market of potatoes to shirts or anything to anything else had to do with the amount of labor it took. They wanted it held up. Marx did. Marx did. Marx developed a labor theory of value from theirs, but he changed it. Really very different. That's why it, it one way you can test if you ever get spoken to by other professors, this is not a nice thing to do, but in case you enjoy this sort of thing, if you hear that professor tell you about the labor theory of value as if there's one, you know, you've got the first sign that you should take another class. But this is an idiot. And a lot of my colleagues have no idea about any of this stuff. And when you that comes out of their mouth, because no one's going to challenge them, but you can now, and you can make it a poignantly unpleasant moment for them. <laughs> which you might want to do uh, because students often like that with teachers and teachers often deserve it. Uh, there are multiple labor theories of value. Smith's is actually a little bit different from Ricardo's and Marx's is different from both of theirs and there were others. There were others with labor theories of value. How did Marx do his different? Marx did two things that neither Smith nor Ricardo did. First, Marx was not interested, again, in explaining prices. So he didn't push the idea that the only thing that determines a price in a market is the amount of labor in it. He was interested that there was a relationship between price and labor. But the notion that, that, that that's all that determined the price struck Marx as ridiculous. That was much more important for people around Smith and Ricardo, but not for Marx. As you'll see, Marx just wanted to get us into the discussion of labor. So he was happy that there was some relationship between a price and labor, but he didn't care that it was exact or important. And the second thing Marx did that was different was he developed the notion that the labor in the labor theory of value shouldn't be what Smith and Ricardo. They actually thought you count up the hours that the carpenter uses to make a house relative to the amount of hours that the shoemaker uses to make a shoe. No, said Marx. The labor that determines value isn't, here we go now, what he called concrete labor. It's not the particular labor of the particularly skilled person. The carpenter here, the shoemaker there, the baker over there. No, he said. The thing that we have to understand is that the labor that's involved in shaping what goods exchange for is something, and then he coined a completely new concept, ad 
abstract layer. Abstract, no such, you can search through Adam Smith or David Ricardo, the phrase abstract labor never appears. In Marx's capital, if that's what all appears, almost only abstract labor. After he tells you it's not concrete labor, what those guys don't like, what do you mean by abstract labor? Here's what he meant, and you can see where he's going, because you all know the end of the story. We're getting over to the labor analysis. He says <coughs> the value of commodities is determined by the available supply of labor in any economy. And he, here he says something that's interesting and wonderfully philosophical. He says in any community, the total of output that can be produced depends on the available labor before it's been specialized into this skill, that skill, this trade, that industry. You know, we have a certain number of people available to work. So many able-bodied, healthy adults between these ages and that, that's it. That's how much wealth we can produce, namely the wealth that could be produced by this group of people. Before, he said, before we allocate, okay, you become a baker, you become a shoemaker, you become a potato grower. Before that, we have something called abstract labor, a kind of pool of the available labor supply. And then he says, you see where Marx is going? He says, in every community, all the time, decisions have to be made as to how to allocate the abstract labor to all the specific tasks. If we take a bunch of people who could do anything and we train them to be shoemakers, they're not going to make potatoes. and They're not going to have those preferences either. And every society has to decide that. I mean, do you want a lot of people making potatoes or just a few? Do you want a lot of people making sandwiches or just a few? And every society is constantly assessing changing the allocation of abstract labor into its specific functions according to what the community wants, needs, the different influences of the different groups. Every society is always doing it. But, says Marx, below the level of consciousness, there is no explicit, let's see, we got 412,000 new babies this year. How many of them should we direct over into manual labor, and how many should we direct them? We don't do that. We have institutions that do that. Family pushes you here or there. School pushes you here or there. Priest or minister or rabbi pushes you here or there, and so on. But every society does it one way or the other, collectively or individually, in the family or not, in this institution or that institution by fiat of government or by <laughs> free choice. But every society does it. And the economy is partly shaped by this because in the end, the value, comes Marx's argument, the value of every commodity is the amount of abstract labor allocated to it. Every commodity has in it a portion of the abstract labor pool of the society. It couldn't be otherwise. That's not a, a complex argument. That's a, that's a tautology. Every commodity is the product of labor. Therefore, every commodity has in it some concrete labor that is the concrete allocation of the abstract labor available 